If you have your Bibles, open with me to uh, Matthew chapter number 3. I'm beginning a, a new series today called Perceptions and Limitations. It'll be uh, today and uh, four more Sundays that follow. I told the first service, I think I've got at least three new series already planned beyond this one. I'm uh, very grateful. The Lord seems to be really speaking in my heart. But this is one of those that uh, he brought me a little while back, and I've been looking forward to it. I'm not sure that this is not one of the most impactful and needful sermons in the day in which we live. Um, I didn't plan this. It's not a, my goodness, I hope it's not a work of Brian, but I do pray that it is a work of God. But if you have your Bibles, if you'd grab them and stand up with me, if you have your phones that are turned to the Bible, whatever, however you look at God's Word, iPads, have it memorized, whatever, you know. Matthew chapter number 3. Let's begin reading God's Word together. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. Now John himself with clo was clothed in camel hair with a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Y'all say yum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to serve that at the restaurant after the service, but maybe. Maybe a little honey, I don't know. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized for him by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. That's an amazing statement right there. But when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to the baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourself, We, are Ab we, has, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Now even now, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father God, you are God of all. You are Lord of all. You are Master. You are King. You are the God of the Word. Draw us to yourself. Father, you are the answer to every need in our life. And Lord, we are grateful that you made a way, Jesus, that we could leave from where we are and find ourselves with you, our Savior of our sins, the compassionate counselor who leads and guides but listens, who changes us from the people that we were to the people we need to be. You are patient and long-suffering and kind. Kind enough to love us where we are, but not leave us where we are. But help change us into the people we need to be. Father, put heaven in our spirit even today. Give us ears to hear, Holy Spirit, what it is that you have us to say. And sir, we will be grateful because of the work that you will do in our lives. May all that is said, all that is done, be for you and for you alone. Father, we are empty vessels waiting to be filled by you. So help us find the end of ourself, and call it that, and find the flow that comes from you, and rejoice in that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I begin then this series and called it Perceptions and Limitations because 
we all have a certain way that we look at things. There are perceptions that we have that we have learned from the time that we were a small, small child. Just the ways that, that we look at that which is called good and what we call evil. That which uh, is bad and must be avoided and that which is acceptable by God and we must uh, welcome into our life. The things that we learn from the time that we were just little kids, a way of, of understanding. Before I even had any really recognition, but I can't remember any of those days, when I was the smallest of child, I learned how to speak. And I learned to speak English. And I speak the dialect in which I speak. Don't y'all look at me funny because y'all can understand me. There are places in this country they don't probably understand me. I've had people stop me and say, I just love to hear you talk. That southern drawl that you've got. I think the more tired I get, the more drawn out I get too. When I was a, a financial planner after college, uh, I went to a place uh, outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota, a place called Chaska, and there they were teaching us all of the products, the stocks, the, the bonds, all of the limited partnerships, the mutual funds, all those things that we would sell and, and how we would uh, build our clientele. And there were people from all over the country that were there that week. And uh, I met up with a, a young man from Missouri. His name was Jim Hoovins. And we became best buds just real quickly you know, in that week. And, and uh, about two weeks, I guess is what it was. And he found out I was from, uh, from uh, Georgia. And if any of y'all remember the early 80s, some of us Georgia fans remember it quite fondly. Um, Y'all remember a guy, number 34, can, can y'all, anybody here say, go Herschel Walker? I mean, he was a unique kind of a person, and the whole country was taken by storm, and, and uh, this guy played a small school, he was quarterback for a small school in Missouri called Pittsburgh State, and, and he said, uh, oh, you got to go to Sanford Stadium, and I said, I've been there many times, you know, and we just became famous friends real quick, and he, he was always tickled by how I talked and how... Uh, my southern drawl I had. And one day we were in a room and there was about 50, 60 of us there and we were talking about something and we were really talking about how when we talk to people and doing sales with them, how we need to stick to the subject and make sure that we do it and, and not make it too long, like my sermons, right? And he said, uh, we, he stopped in the, 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 the guy that was teaching us, he said, and, and by the way, Jim called me dog because uh I'm a Georgia Bulldog fan. He said, he said, what are we going to do about somebody like dog? He gets out there and he'll, he'll, it'll take him all day to make a presentation. I said, so why? I just spoke up and said, why would you say that? Everybody laughed, but everybody understood. I didn't teach myself to do that. That's just kind of how I learn things, right? How many, how many of y'all know there are certain things that you, and certain sayings that you learn from your parents Y'all ever heard this one? I don't know where it came from. But I get somebody get I get mad at something, I look at it and say, Dog bite a mule. Now, for all you that are watching online, I don't know what that means either. Well, I know what it means, but I don't know why. I don't know why I said it. But there are things that we learn like that all the time. There are certain ways in which we do things. There are certain ways in which we look at things. There are certain things that we look at and we say, that's wrong. That, now that's just wrong. And there are some things that we look at and we say, you know, we should do more of that. Why don't we do more of that? Why am I talking about this? Because I think that there are certain perceptions, there are certain limitations that we put upon God, and there are certain limitations that God wants to put upon us that, that may be things that we are doing that may be not matching up with what God wants. It had been 400 years since the last prophet in Israel. His name was Malachi. And he wrote the last book of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, when he finished up the last book of the Old Testament, the last couple verses talked about the one who would come and be the forerunner. Here when we look in Matthew 3, it talks about that one, and it's a quotation from Isaiah, the one who would be the forerunner, the one who would come before the prepare the way, the one who would take the mountains and lower them and take the valleys and raise them up to make the path straight, get them ready for the Christ when he would come. But it had been 400 years 
since the Jewish people had a prophet to stand up and pro- proclaim, Thus saith the Lord. I got thinking about that. Our country this summer, the United States of America, will be 245 years old. Now that sounds like a long time, but when you, say, when you put the, 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 the birth of our nation, when you put that against 400 years, sounds kind of like a long period of time. 400 years where all they had was the word of the Old Testament, the scriptures of the Old Testament. But something happened during that 400 years. They took the word of God, the words of God, written by the prophets and the men of God, and they added to them what was called oral tradition. And it was given the same weight as the Word of God. And it was brought down from generation to generation to generation. And the problem with that was, that was their interpretation, but you know how interpretation or how we look at things, things change a little bit. With time, we were, I was talking to someone before the first service today, and, and, and we were talking about the 50s, the 1950s. I wasn't born. And, but they were talking about the time that we, in America, and, and, and one made a comment and said, I wish we could go back to the 1950s. Really what they were talking about was the, the way that the America thought in the day. As a matter of fact, in between services, I was talking to some people on the, on the front steps, and they were talking about some things that they, I came out and they quit talking about it. No, they, they were talking about how things are being done in the world today, and, and they made a comment. He said, I don't think it's going to last very much the way we're doing things today. Really, if you take both conversations, they were saying things used to be pretty good, but things have changed. That's what happened generation after generation after generation For 400 years, they brought a lot of man's wisdom in and called it oral traditions, but it wasn't the ways of God. It was a lot of how people looked at things, but it wasn't necessarily how God looked at things. And in that day and in that time, God sent the one Malachi said will come in the spirit of Elijah. We know him as John the Baptist. And in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Mark, and in Luke, and in John, all four come in 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 different ways but present John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one who would come and prepare the way for the Christ when he would come. And when John came, he was different. He was a preacher of the Gospel. He was a prophet, the first prophet in 400 years, who would stand up and proclaim Here is the words of God. And he didn't go to the synagogues where the people were. He went out to the wilderness. He did a different type ministry. A different way of thinking. Matter of fact, he'd been different his whole life. Even from the time his dad, Zechariah, was told by the angel that, that their child, that he would have a child and he would be different. And Zechariah was from the line of Aaron, the, of the tribe of Levi. He was a priest in the temple. As a matter of fact, some think that he possibly, if he had stayed in that vein, could have possibly could have been in the line for one of the chief priests. Yet when God came to him and told him that he would bring them his, his, this unique child, who we would know as John the Baptizer, He raised him differently to seek to hear from God directly. And John didn't, he didn't preach like others preached. He didn't go to the synagogues. He went to the wilderness where God would have to bring the people to him. He didn't wear what the people that were the priests of the day wore. He took a camel's hair. By the way, I had a camel's hair coat one time, but that's not, I don't think, what they're talking about here. It's what they would make tents out of. But literally, it sounds like he took the leftovers because he didn't really care about impressing people with his clothes. The only thing I could say that John and I had in common was I have a leather belt around my waist too. That's about it. 
and he ate locusts. Mm. I got one no in the back, Charles. I see the head shaking. Charles says, no, thank you. I don't think that you're going to go to the local diner and go in there and say, can I have some locusts today? I don't think they're serving it. Well, listen, he just leaned upon God to bring to him what he needed in every aspect of his life. And he preached a sermon of repentance. Repent. It's not a very popular sermon today. You know why it's not popular? Because we like it kind of the way we are. We're very comfortable where we are. We've come to a place in time that this we'll call wrong and we won't do that. And this we'll say, well, that's okay. And we'll accept this. And we won't accept that. And we'll look at the old time religion from generation to generation, and we'll say, this is what the church has done, and this is what we should do, and all we can follow is the oral tradition of what the world has been saying. I think God may be asking us to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. Repent. Repent. See, I think we get very comfortable in what we think and what we believe. The problem is, if it's not what God believes, He's not going to change. We need to. Let me give you some examples. And God helped me to to say this correctly. I'm not just, I could go on all day, example after example after example. I'm not picking on anyone. But let, let me just explain a few things. In 1973, the Supreme Court came down. The court in the United States that says this can be law, this can't be law, and they, they take it against the, the Constitution. They came out and said uh, abortion is legal. I was 11 years old when that came out. I remember all the things and all the debate, and I went to church and I heard people say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Not so much today. Not so, not so much. In the 80s and in the 90s, it's got to where we've watered it down. Now it is a political stance. It is a woman's right. And I am amazed by by women who say, oh, no, no, you can't tell me it's my body. Look, if you're taking the life of another, it's murder. I don't care what you call it. God looks at it and says it's an abomination. And there's a lot of people who are going to meet some children in heaven some because a mama did not abort her child, but had, uh, could not carry her child to, to term. And she'll meet that child because that child was alive and well. And, and that mom will meet her child for the first time when they get to heaven. But a lot of them just murdered their child. But I'm here to tell you, God takes care of those too. And you can slice it whatever you way you want to look at it politically. Wrong is wrong whether you accept it or not. It's wrong. But I will tell you today, that's not a popular message. When I was growing up, no one ever, well, some, would live together before marriage. But it wasn't well known. But the Bible says that there are certain things you don't do before marriage. By the way, it's plain about it. But now we all define it in a different way. We look at it and we say, well, I don't know if that's right or not. That might be wrong for them, but it doesn't have to be wrong for me. Can I tell you, I'm a pastor. Oh, my goodness. And and people will come to me for premarital counseling. And in my 34 years, the ones that I have spoke to, that have not had premarital sex, one hand, if that don't scare you to death, today it has become common for people to live together before marriage with my hand to the Lord. I know of one whose parents 
told them, you need to do this before you get married. Try it out. Make sure before you get married. Christian parents, pro- professing Christian parents. I don't care what the world says. The line has grown gray and Satan is happy. If it's right, amen. If it's wrong, amen. I could go on all day and tell you there are examples after examples after examples. But here's what I'm trying to say. When John came, after 400 years, things had become changed. Oral traditions had become the standard to live by. It was accepted. But what he was trying to say was, we need to repent of anything, Lord help me, of everything, whether you call it big or little. Oh, I can tell already people are turning me off. I don't care. Let the Holy Spirit speak. He can kick a door down that I can't open. Listen, there are things that we look at and we say, I don't think that's a big deal. You don't get a vote. You're not on the throne. If you want to be right with God, you must listen to the Holy Spirit of God. He will inform you. He will convict you. He will lead you. And in any area of your life, in every area of your life, that you're not conformed to the Holy Spirit, He should attack you. He should convict you. He should draw you to Himself. You should come at it, whether you call it big, whether you call it little. You should say, I don't want to give an inch. Because an inch will lead a mile. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Repent. Repent. And what has happened is we have allowed room in our life for debate. Don't you look so holy because you've done it. Well, I don't know if that's right or not. I don't know if that's wrong or not. It's okay to think about it. But don't get into this point where this is what the Word of God says, but I think I want to do what I want to do. I don't want any substance in my body that controls how I think, act, and feel other than the Holy Spirit. You water it down if you want to. You hear me? I don't want any word to come out of my body except a word that the Holy Spirit could amen. So if gossip comes out of my lips and the Holy Spirit says no, it is sin. Running someone down, talking behind their back in one way that you wouldn't say to their face, it's grieving the Holy Spirit of God. As a pastor... Man, we, we made a joke, Brother Bradley. And if, if we're counting numbers, we, we say it's ministerially speaking. If we have 101, we'll say we had close to 200. You know what that's called? A lie. And the Holy Spirit hates liars. Come on now. Who is the father of lies? Satan. And what does he do? He comes in disguised as an angel of light. He may look like he's the right thing, but if any conversation is trying to get you to water down, back up, slow down in any way other than the way and the truth and the life, the goodness of God, he's leading you in a way you don't need to go. You don't need to give up an inch. You don't need to let one area into your life. Time for me to confess. When uh, I've already told the church this, this is not new news to you. When I was a young teenager, I would curse. I played sports. It was big. We thought we would, we had to, to curse. It was locker room talk, and we did that. And by the way, I learned it, and 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 I, I, I my parents never heard me. I mean, I could control it. But there was a way in my life that I just let it go, and and I would say words before I even thought about it. It just slipped out of my mouth. And I got under conviction, and I I began to ask the Lord to, to remove it from my life, and He did. Can I tell you, praise God, He did. I haven't had a curse word come out of my mouth since I was 21 years of age. God's people said. And as a young preacher, 
man, I was zealous about this. And, and I got to the point where I got so under conviction, I didn't even want to hear a curse word. So we had cable TV. Does anybody remember cable TV? And I remember the old preachers talked about HBO, and they called it Hell's Box Office. And, and, and you, could, you could listen to, to, to movies on HBO, and there would be dirty words in it. We never had HBO at our house. But listen, I got under such conviction that how many of y'all remember VCRs? If you're a young person, you'll have to ask an older person. They'll describe it to you. But you could hook up your cable to the VCR, and it would come out of the VCR into the TV. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And in the VCR, there was a thing called curse-free TV. And every time a curse word came up, it would not let you hear it, but it would do closed captioning, and it would bring up another word that would come up. It would translate it. If they said, bleep, 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 it would come up on the closed captioning, golly gee, you know, something like that. Right. It, it made it real hard to listen to preaching, though, because every time they, they, somebody would be preaching and say, God, and they'd, they, oh, they're going to say a dirty word, so they'd bleep it out, you know. Because they, you know, how people say GD and damn the name of our God. Well, as a young preacher, I got zealous about it, and I told everybody, I don't even want to hear a curse word. And then something happened to our. VC, well, I guess they went by the wayside. I don't know what happened to it. But I didn't have curse-free TV anymore. Let me tell you, yesterday, can I say yesterday? Not 10 years ago. Yesterday, I was watching something actually on my phone. It was a show. It was a TV show. Nothing bad. And yet, they were using language, and the Holy Spirit went. <laughs> Brian, do you remember? Do you remember? I was listening to a show that would let curse words fly, and it wouldn't bother me like it used to bother me. It uh, didn't upset me like it upset me before. There would be times that if I heard a dirty word, I would just go up and we'd just turn the station. We'd turn it off. But here I caught myself watching something with words in it, and the Holy Spirit came and touched my heart. Listen, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And though I had come to accept it, the Holy Spirit never had. And if I want to walk with him, I'm going to have to repent of the areas in my life that do not match up to the blessed work of God. It's not my job to give you the hundred things to watch out for. It's my job to tell you to listen to the one who will. Day by day. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Day by day, let Him preach to you the message of repentance. Because repentance is a grace gift. It's something you can pray for. And grace is that which is bestowed upon us that we cannot receive on our own. We need His blessing to receive it. And repentance means God will come and bring it to you. But because it is a grace gift, you must receive it. And when the Holy Spirit begins to convict, you must say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because what we want is how God looks at it is the way we look at it. And if there's any area of in our life that does not conform to the image of Christ, it's open game. The Pharisees and the Sadducees walked down there to where John was baptizing. He was baptizing them unto repentance. And, and they were confessing their sins. 
publicly confessing their sins. They were showing that they were going to say, this is wrong. And I will tell you it's wrong. And I want to do what's right. And they were being baptized, going to under the water, showing death, raised to walk in newness of life. It was a baptism of repentance. I no longer want to live that way. And then he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees walking down. And they were coming to check John out. Is he doing this right? And John looks at him and said, Road of vipers. Your Bible may look at that and take that word brood and, and, and may say generation, because it really that's what it means. And vipers, you may say, is translated a, as a serpent, but it's translated as a wicked, cunning person. A generation of wicked, cunning people. The Pharisees had been taught. Not simply the Word of God, but they put a greater adherence to the oral tradition. Tradition. What they said was right. What they said was wrong. He said, you've, you've taken it from generation to generation to generation. You don't realize, you don't know that you're living outside the will of God. And God will not bless that which quenches his spirit. Who told you to flee? Don't say that you're children of Abraham. God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Don't just say you're religious. You know one of the things that bothers me today is I see no difference in repentance between people who call themselves Christians and the world. Case in point, those having abortions, same rate, Christians, non-Christians. That's scary. That's scary. The greatest witness for this world today is a group of people who are following after God, who are seeking God's blessing on their life, and the world can look at us and say we're different. The worst witness is when they look at us and they can't tell any difference between us and the world, everybody else. Do you think we need a sermon of repentance? Not my 50 things, not my hobby horse, not the things that God's, the Holy Spirit of God. Look what it says here. Verse 10, even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. And therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Oh my goodness. I don't want anyone to go to the fires of hell from the benches of New Holland Baptist Church because they're deceived by the one who wants to bring up a debate in our life of, is this wrong? Is that wrong? Anytime there's a debate, you need to run quickly to your knees and get on your knees before God and say, God, I will do exactly what you want me to do. Don't let him water it down. Look what he says. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Hear this illustration. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Here's the picture of the threshing floor. When they would go out and get the wheat, they would put it in this place, and he would take a shovel, and he would shovel it up, and he would throw it up into the air. And in the head of the wheat, there would be a grain of wheat, but it would be covered with something called chaff. And the chaff would turn loose, and it would be blown away. But because of the weight of the seed, it would fall down. So they would throw it up, and there would be a fan blowing to blow out the chaff. And after a point in time, all the way they would be left with was the true wheat. In Matthew 13, Jesus told the parable of the wheat and the tares. 
And the difference between the wheat and the tares is the wheat has the seed in the head at the top. But the tear looks exactly like it, but it's empty-headed. There's no seed there. What shall we do? Shall we go in and take the, the tares out? No, 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 no. You won't be able to distinguish them, the parable goes. He says, wait until the end, and then those who come to reap at the harvest will gather up the tares and separate them off from the wheat, and the tares will be burned with fire. And the wheat will be kept. Let me take you back to Malachi, to the fourth chapter. This is where the Word of God stopped 400 years before Christ came. This is four verses ahead of the two verses that talk about John, who would come to prepare the way for Christ. Malachi 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. The day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. They will leave them neither root nor branch. What was it John the Baptist said? He's laid the axe already at the root of the tree. He told them to repent. By the way, they didn't repent. And God took it away from the Jews and gave it to the Gentiles and everyone else. A.D. 70, he let the Romans burn Jerusalem down. And they were scattered Listen to what he says. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow like grow fat like stall fed cattle. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Two groups. One gathered in. One burned ashes under the feet. One that repented. One that did not. I've heard a lot of preaching in my days. A lot of poor preaching. I've done a lot of it myself. I've heard preachers stand up and rail against this, rail against that. I honestly, I've, I've shared this illustration before. I heard a preacher preach against hair dryers because it was modern. He had that grease back vitalis look. And anybody who washed their hair and dried it with a hair dryer was modern and was of the children of Satan. I'm not talking about that. But if you don't think we've moved from the center of God's will, inch by inch, step by step. If you don't think that we followed traditions of man and held them of higher importance than the will of God, you don't have a clue. But under the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, He whispers the most encouraging, the most loving words to our heart. The greatest gift is the gift of repentance. You may think that when you repent of those things that you enjoy so very much, that you would live in detriment. I promise you just the opposite. If you line up with God and repent of that which is wrong and seek to do that which is right, you'll find joy unspeakable and full of glory. You'll have the peace that goes beyond all understanding. You'll have the burdens lifted away. But if you walk that guilty walk distant from God, choosing what you want, choosing what you think, judging others, choosing Satan's path, 
Yeah, he's good at what he does. Bait and switch. He's good at what he does. Oh, you need to have this. The old preacher wearing a camel coat, eating locusts for lunch, who Jesus said you won't find any greater because he lived a life not following the road that everybody else was going. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, but the narrow path that led him to the throne of God. What a preacher. What a life. I dare say that all of us have room for repentance. My prayer is that we'll hear and let it begin today.